there was time back, I think in my 20s or early 30s, where I had gone to a workshop where they were talking about how our experiences actually become part of our very being and our emotional system. And then they like triggers after that, once that intense emotion becomes part of your very being, then in the future, as you live your life, when you experience something, those triggers are brought up again, and then you react in the very same way that you did the very first time you had this sort of an experience. So that in itself was an eye opener for me. And as, as I worked with that, I realized how my thoughts were holding me back. And it's all that self-talk and that kind of stuff that I was doing with myself that was controlling how I behave. Just a heads up that this is the final episode in season six and I really appreciate your support. We'll be back with many more incredible people with their inspiring stories in August when we launch season seven. So I hope you'll be able to join me and until then, just take really good care of you and know that you are loved and never alone in this journey. What's the story you tell yourself about your grief? That it's not fair? You don't understand why it happened, that you could have done something to change the outcome, that life is just not worth living without your loved one, or it could be any number of variations on those themes or something entirely different. However, the story you were telling yourself is the difference between being moored in a safe harbor to ride out your grief or the feeling of being set adrift, facing insurmountable wave after wave, feeling overwhelmed and unable to move forward. My guest today on The Beautiful Side of Grief, Ashmita Rama Madhav, knows what it's like to be adrift in intense grief. She's been through the ringer since her early 20s, having experienced miscarriage, rejection, the loss of her parents and her husband. She has had a lot of emotions to work through and in doing so discovered the profound impact our thoughts have on shaping our reality. And she's going to share that research with us today. Ashmita exudes love, acceptance, forgiveness, gratitude, growth and self-discovery. She is a dedicated resilience and grief support advocate and expert, entrepreneur, author, and lifelong learner. And she is the founder of the Growth Story Hub, an organization created to inspire and empower individuals who have lost a loved one either suddenly or to terminal illness and who are feeling stuck, overwhelmed, numb, and vulnerable. I just know this episode is going to resonate with so many of you. So let's get into it. Ashmita, wonderful to have you share your journey and wisdom with us today. Hi, Helen. I'm so happy to be here to share my experience with grief. And I'm just going to say your last name again, because I feel like I mucked it up. So it's Madhav? It's uh, Madhav. Madhav, Madhav. Yes. Okay, Madhav. All right. Sorry. (laughs) Okay. You're fine. Thank you. <laughs> I, was, I just think it's nice to try and get the name right. It I appreciate just, that. You're welcome. <laughs> All right. So where shall we start? Because you've been through so many different types of grief, I would love to start with you sharing with us how everything began to unfold for you in your early 20s, the different types of grief you experienced. And then let's just Take it from there. Sure. In my early 20s, when I experienced rejection and miscarriage and that kind of stuff, at that point, I guess my mindset was very different to what it is today. At that time, it was like, why is this happening to me? Everything, everything's wrong with me. Why is everybody else's? This doesn't happen to others. And even if it does, they seem to be fine. Why me? that mindset and that mentality and also the mentality of feeling like I'm a victim and I'm not worthy. How come others can maybe have a baby or not be rejected or not have the kind of experiences that I had when I was that age. 
and getting stuck in that narrative in my mind kept me there for a fair amount of time before I actually realized after doing a lot of self-discovery and reading books, meditation, I've always been interested in meditation and yoga and uh, natural healing and those kind of things. So as I ventured out onto these various different paths and educated myself about that, these various different uh, things, I slowly started realizing that something's different. I, the world around me still goes on. Things are still happening, yet I still feel the way I feel. So I was on the brink at the very beginning stages of understanding or even getting to understand that your thoughts actually shape your reality. How, what do you think of yourself? The self-talk that you do with yourself on a daily basis based on any experience that you have actually shapes your reality in so many ways. Our minds are so powerful. Our thoughts are so powerful. Our feelings are just as powerful. And all of that put together creates your reality. That is what I know now. But mm -hmm. as I was walking this path and going through it in my 20s, it was like, no, okay, I guess I'm just destined to have this type of a life. I'm not worthy of anything. I don't deserve to be loved or have a successful marriage or have a kid or all those crazy things that I had in my head, which when I look back now, I'm like, wow, if I had only known what I know now, Back then, I would have stopped myself from being my own worst enemy because that's basically what it boils down to. Isn't hindsight such a wonderful thing that we can look back and say, if I only knew only. what I know now back then. Yes, Where do true. you think all those self-doubts, feelings of not being worthy? Because I feel like so many of us are going down that path and we may be conscious of it or we may not be like I thought mm -hmm. I was doing everything right why yes. does this keep happening to me what is it yes. about me where did that start for you I think it's all just slowly starting to unfold for me now especially I think that my biggest hit I've been hit every single time I experienced a loss in different ways but this time, when my uh, husband passed away four years ago after struggling with pancreatic cancer, and what happened, the, the life that I've been living for the last four years, just trying to understand what this means in my life, at this point in my life, has brought me to realize something very important. And that is, as human beings, we all, we need to have other people in our lives. We are social beings. We're not meant to live in isolation. Okay, we can, I'm not saying we cannot, and there's nothing wrong with living in isolation, but we thrive when we are with other people. And the other thing that is important is, like young children, they look for validation from the people that they find important in their life. And as we are growing, we become young children. Teenagers are looking for validation from their peers. As you get older, when you're in the workforce, you're looking for validation from those people where it really counts, right? So in a family structure as well, we're all looking for that validation, a sense of belonging. Where do we belong? And when somebody that you love so much or somebody close to you, a spouse or a parent or sibling or whatever it is, somebody that you had that real close connection with, somebody who understands you, somebody who can do something for you without you even saying, I need this. Someone who has your back is what a lot of people, they say these days, somebody who has, the, has your back, who knows you in and out kind of thing. When you lose that person in your life, it just totally throws you off. It totally makes you feel disillusioned. That's how I felt. I don't know if everybody else feels that way, but I can definitely speak from my experience. Yeah. So that just pushes you into that space. Just feeling that sense of validation is so important. And when you're grieving, when you don't get that validation, it is so easy then to go into a depression or things like that. But the beautiful side about the whole thing is if we know this information upfront, and we're aware of it, then we know what to expect. Okay, I'm expecting to feel this way 
there I go. I'm actually feeling it right now. That awareness, knowing, okay, I'm actually feeling like I need this validation from somebody. Nobody's giving it to me. Nobody can give it to me. It's not because it's a gray area we walk with. When people don't know how to support you, you don't know how to, what kind of support you want. You do want people involved, but you don't want people involved. Yes. It's so, it's and it's so unique to each person because we're walking this path that is a journey. It, it honestly is a journey once embraced can turn out to be such a beautiful journey that takes you on this path where you learn so much about life, the meaning of life, the true meaning of life, of relationships, and of who you are and what it means to actually be human. Okay, you just mentioned the true meaning of life. What does that mean to you? To me, what the true meaning of life basically means is I am human, I am alive, and I have the ability to love and to give. And the only way we get anything in life is by giving and expanding ourselves so that we could have that, that empathy, embracing empathy and having empathy, gratitude and forgiveness be part of your life. So any interaction that you have in this world with anyone should come from a space of empathy, gratitude, forgiveness, uh, awareness, all of this other, you just find that you're living on a whole different plane. You don't have to find yourself caught up in petty little, oh, you did that to me. Oh, the, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That forgiveness is so, so important. I know I struggled with that for many years in my life. And it's not about forgiving the other person. It all comes down to yourself Mm -hmm. and you being able to let those situations go, allow that to have happened and not to carry it into the here and now every single day of your life and into the future. And I think that was a big realization for me. It wasn't Mm -hmm. about the other person. It was all about me and what I needed to do. So as soon as you put expectations on people, you're probably going to be disappointed because they have their own journey. You have yours, they have theirs. Let them walk theirs and you just concentrate on doing what you need to do. Yes, I fully agree with that. I agree with that. And I'd like to add to that is that let them walk their journey, you walk yours, but also include that empathy and that gratitude into it because it's not a competition. It is not a competition. We don't need to criticize anyone. We don't need to judge anybody. But if you can help somebody who is, and if they will accept the help, then give it to them. But if they don't want to accept the help, then that means they're not ready. You can't force them. It's the same like with children. When my husband passed away, my kids were 7, 14, and 16. And each one of them in their own space and their personalities and the developmental age that they were at that given time were in different space, different. It was just so different. So I'm glad that I had done research and I had read into this kind of stuff and I just decided to meet them where they are, each one in their space. And yes. it was different. It was really taxing because what I do with one kid is not going to work with the next kid or the next kid. So I'm doing three different things with three different children at the same time while trying to manage my grief. And that is where the whole expectation thing comes in is I had to remove expectations out of the equation. I am not going to expect my kid. I, I, I decided, I said to myself, it's that self-talk. I told myself, I am not going to expect if I get a certain result out of one of my kids because I'm doing something to help them as they going through this grieving process, I'm not going to expect the same from the next kid. So important. And it is paying off now, four years later. It's mm. going to be five years this October. It's slowly starting to pay off now only. So it's a process. We've got to just have the, keep the communication channels open, give that empathy, and just keep talking and meet people where they are. It's this whole idea of meet me where with, give me what I need 
not what you think I need. Give me what I think I need. And if I don't know what I need, help me figure out what I need. But it's not about you. It's about me. So I was just uh, thinking about that because often in grief, we don't know what we need. We think we do. We and don't. then when we get it, we go, oh. And, exactly. and so how do we go about working out what it is we need? From my personal experience, I know there were times where I would think to myself, I keep saying this over and over again, grief is a lonely place, I have to be mm. honest. And there are times where I wish with all my heart that the life that I led, the interactions that I had with people before my husband died could have been maintained after he died as well. But they all dissolved and disappeared for no no valid reason. They just disappeared. It just And it's, no, it's a two-way thing, right? So it's mm. no like nothing to read between any lines there, but it's just the reality of the way things are. And um, I always wondered to myself, you know, I'd like to have that, but then when I think of where I am right now and how I feel and how my emotions are so like a roller coaster up and down, and the one minute I do want somebody near me to sit and console me or to talk about the person that I lost and things like that. And then... After a little while, I'm like, I'm uncomfortable. I don't want to talk about this anymore. And I actually don't want you to show me that much of affection. <laughs> I appreciate having the support. I appreciate knowing that somebody is there for me. I reach out when I need help. And if I don't reach out, I appreciate that you at least check in with me. So you see how it can be very confusing for a person on the other side? Oh. It's what does the person want? I'm trying to be there for them and they not. And then if that person gives you too much space, then that space becomes something that it's just too much space. And then it's okay. I don't even know you anymore and we don't have anything to talk about anymore. So it's okay if we don't talk. Yeah, those are all really valid. And I, as you were talking, I was remembering <laughs> those same scenarios that I went through myself with each of those. Let's let's talk about something that is very real to those who are grieving deeply and intensely. It's mm-hmm. like after you meet all those initial milestones of working through that person passing, organizing their funeral, going through all of that, and then shortly after that, it seems like life goes on for everybody else, but you're still stuck where you are not able to move forward did you find that yourself and how did you navigate that I most definitely found that each time my mom died when my mom passed away I felt that when my husband passed away and two years ago when my dad passed away as well I felt the exact same thing my relationships the the intensity of my relationship with each one of these people who passed away was very different they meant different things to me in my life but yes i just navigating that whole feeling of life went on for the world the world kept spinning it's as if nothing happened it's as Mm -hmm. if i also felt at times it was as if my parents or my husband never existed because nobody talks about them yes and i felt like i was imagining this is sometimes your mind plays tricks on you and did this person really exist i know for a fact this person existed why is nobody talking about them i want to talk about them I want to, it's my way of remembering them the more I talk about them. But no, it's big funerals done. Everything's done. The morning period's over. Life has gone on. Everybody's gone back to their thing. And here I am. I'm stuck. And to me, it is everything because these people had such close impact in my life. So yes, I'm stuck. This new reality that I'm forced into is what so i had to do a lot of thinking and trying to navigate that has taken a lot of self-talk and analyzing a lot of my thoughts and feelings and living more in the moment as i said earlier grief is like a roller coaster right some days and and i actually just had that one of those roller coaster things this morning woke up feeling really like down and okay i went to bed feeling just fine Mm -hmm. I woke up this morning feeling really no energy, 
why is this? This is not fair. I'm already five years in. My mom's passed away almost 15 years ago, but I still have this. What? It's not fair. I don't have my mom. I would. I wish I had her now because there's so many things that I needed to ask her to get her advice on. And there's nobody else that can give me the kind of advice she would have given me. So it's, that's when I stopped myself in my tracks. Okay, I'm going to stop shooting all over myself. The past is the past. It is history. It has happened. Leave it where it belongs. Do not bring it into the present moment is what I say to myself. So if you leave the past in the past, you can think about it now and then, but that's all you need to do is think about it. Don't allow it or don't allow any thoughts from the past to control your present moment. In, and the, the best way to pre, uh, practice living in the present moment is gratitude. Gratitude yeah. is so powerful. It has been a life changer for me. It has saved me so many ways. Every time I'm feeling down, every time I have these thoughts come into my mind that makes me feel like, oh, you're a widow. Nobody's going to want to have anything to do with you. Yeah. Oh, it's amazing. The weird conditioned, weird belief. I don't even know where some of these thoughts come from. I'm like, I don't really believe that. Where did this thought come from in my mind? Mm. But I guess it's society, it's movies, it's, it's life. Whatever you've been exposed to somehow molds your thoughts. But is that really me? Is that who I truly am? Is what I ask myself. And no, I don't believe these thoughts. Yes, I may be a widow, but that doesn't mean my life comes to an end. And when I practice gratitude, the way I would practice gratitude for that is to maybe, not maybe, but to remind myself, I have had the opportunity to be married, to, to have an amazing marriage for whatever an amount of time. I'm grateful that I had that opportunity, at least. I know what it feels like to be loved and to love someone. And thank you. Just thank you for at least having that. Oh, um, yeah, that's so powerful, isn't it? And that was one of the pivotal things that I used after my daughter died was gratitude. Mm -hmm. Whenever mm -hmm. I got into a funk or felt like I was spiraling into that dark place, yes, that's what I yes. used to do was say, okay, what am I grateful for right here, right now in this moment? Mm -hmm. And it may yep. be just the simple things as like having a roof over my head and the sun shining. And it doesn't have to be big and complex. It's the real basics, but it just lifts your energy, doesn't it? It absolutely does. And seriously, try it. Anyone listening out there, try it out. It's absolutely, I'm bought on that. Oh, I'm on that. sold on that. I do it daily because it's <laughs> been so powerful. And I, do you know what? Mm -hmm. I thought I knew about gratitude before my daughter died. I thought, yeah, I'm a grateful person. I know about mm -hmm. gratitude. Not in the same way that I started to practice it after she died. That just took my life to a whole new level. Mm -hmm. It's just like it just started to part those clouds. And mm -hmm. for me to be able to see life through a different lens and what had happened to me. That's it. That's yes. It. yes. So, let's, so let's look at another aspect that is often really pivotal when we experience an intense grief event. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that is like, life no longer seeming to have meaning or being the same again. Did you experience this? And if so, what did that, how did that impact you? And what did that look like for you? My very first experience with death was when my mom passed away. Mm -hmm. And the type of relationship that I had with my mom, she was my best friend. She, aside from just being my mom, she was also my best friend. So it was a, re it, it, it really knocked me. And I remember at the time I had my, both my older kids who are 20 now, but they were like four and six years old at the time. And I was living in a different country altogether to where my mom was when she passed away. And I remember when I got back after the funeral and things like that, every single day, walking around, doing my shopping, doing, taking care of the kids, doing whatever it is, it was just, I had this weird thought. I don't, I think I know why it came into my head. It's because my mom died, but 
the thought was, what's the point of this? I'm going to die anyway. So I walked mm. around when I was doing my shopping, when I was cooking, when I was taking care of the kids. No matter what I did, this thought was at the back of my head. So it drove me and drove the way, the quality of the way I did things and the, my life at that time. So my husband at the time had noticed because he, he noticed a change in me, not the same anymore. And he went on to saying that he's trying really hard to support me. And I knew that he was. I could see that he was really trying hard to support me. And he was very supportive in whatever worked to help me feel better. But he was at a crossroads. So he said, to me, I am trying everything that I know to help that so I could help you and support you and be there for you. But... I realized something very important, and that is there is no way I'm going to be able to understand how you feel because I've not lost a parent before. I, I, I don't know what it feels like to lose, a, uh, lose someone you love and someone you feel that connected to. And that in itself was an eye-opener for me because mm -hmm. it shifted the, the quality of our interaction then because it made me realize at that moment that he is trying, he's doing the best he can. I have to take, I have to put in extra effort so that I can help him to help me and I can help myself as well because so we, he doesn't know. So can I just ask, were you expecting sure. him to understand the depth of your relationship with your mother and the connectedness and how that was now impacting you with the loss of that? I was expecting him to understand because he knew mm. how close I was with my mom. So I was expecting him to be supportive. Mm. But when he made that statement, it knocked me out of that, uh, off those tracks that I was on and pushed me onto a whole different track that made me realize, no, I cannot be expecting this out of him. He's doing the best that he can. But yes. I'm grateful for that because that pushed me onto a path where I then started doing a lot of self-discovery and asking every time, why do I have this thought in my mind? Why do I feel like there is no reason to live? I had that thought for at least a good few years in my mind. I kept, it definitely changed the quality of my life. I felt absolutely, there's no point in any of this. Why should I even bother or put any effort into mm -hmm. what I'm doing? I'm just going to go through the motions. And that quality of that kind of life is not really a quality life because life is so precious. Life is so precious. And I think what really, we all know life is precious. Those words are self-explanatory, right? But right. to get the true meaning of what it means when life, to say and to feel what it means, what that statement means, came to me when my husband took his last breath, Oof. I was holding his hand and the lady at the hospice had said to me, they, they explained to me, I learned something new about the, when the body is preparing to die, what happens and all of that kind of stuff. I didn't know all this information before. Who looks at, who, who even educates themselves about this kind of stuff, right? Yeah. But here I am, I find myself in this situation and they, they're giving you all the support and they're explaining things to you. They're trying to prepare you and help you so that the more information you have, the better equipped you are. And so, yes, there I am sitting there. My husband's going into this conscious, unconscious kind of state, you know, his breathing is changing slowly over the hours and minutes and that kind of stuff. I'm holding his hand the whole time, sitting and praying. And the nurse comes into the room and she says to me, she sits next to me and she's like, so how are things going? I'm telling her what I noticed and things like that. She says, yes, we're getting close. It's time's getting close. And she took my attention. She took my attention for a moment to a picture, a family picture on the wall. And she made a comment to me. She said, you know, you look so much younger now than you do in that picture on the wall. And I was like, what is she talking about? So I glanced at the picture. In that split moment is when he took his last breath. When I look back, I saw him still. I was still holding his hand. And, and this was like within five seconds. And she, and, and so I was like, oh, 
So is he doing one of those things again that you explained to me where they, he just holds his breath for a bit and then suddenly start breathing again? And she looked at me and she said, no, my dear, he's gone. And, oh my God. I was, I, I, the amount of the mixed emotions that ran through me at that moment, I cannot explain. I'm actually starting to feel it right now. Oh my God. Excuse me. But that is... When I look back and I think of that moment, I realize, and it just knocked me, life is so, so, so precious. This is an opportunity that we have to make something beautiful. So what are we going to do about that? How are we going to make this life beautiful? I think both you and I have been through enough of these experiences to know that and to see that because... That is exactly what I wanted people to know. It's like mm -hmm. we are not guaranteed anything. And so we just have to make the most of each and every day. The tough times, the good times, we just okay. have to make the most of every single moment we have because we don't know what is around that corner for us. Correct. So correct. Are you feeling lost, anxious, unsure of how to navigate the loss of your beautiful loved one? Don't know where to head next? Yeah, I get that. Then you may be interested in a letter of hope and aroha to help you find out who you are right here and now and how you can navigate that without being on that emotional roller coaster, feeling out of control. That's a feeling I really disliked after Tal and then Adrian died. So I've developed an eight-week support program where each week you get an email of what worked for me, as well as other tried and true tools to help with grief. It's a beautiful, calming, healing resource that I think you're really going to like and that you can use in your everyday life to find out what works for you and what doesn't. And the great thing is, you find yourself feeling stronger and more in control so you can work out what you want life to look like going forward. So if this sounds like something you would like to check out, head over to my website or check out the link in the episode notes. You're looking for a letter of hope and aroha. So how did you then get on to really understanding the impact that our thoughts have around how we're thinking and how that is going to change the moment that we're in, especially in these difficult moments. As I said, over the years, I have actually been practicing this with myself and it's been like more than 10 years. There was time back, I think in my 20s or early 30s, where I had gone to a workshop where they were talking about how our experiences actually become part of our very being and our emotional system. And then they like triggers after that. Once that intense emotion becomes part of your very being, then in the future, as you live your life, when you experience something, those triggers are brought up again and then you react in the very same way that you did the very first time you had a, this sort of an experience. So that in itself was an eye opener for me. And as, as I worked with that, I realized how my thoughts were holding me back. And it's all that self-talk and that kind of stuff that I was doing with myself that was controlling how I behave. So if somebody, let me think of an example. If so, maybe somebody behaved a certain way with me or someone did not behave a certain way with me that I expected them to behave with me, their actions push me into a situation where I am feeling bad. But just before that whole experience took place, I was fine. I was happy. So something doesn't make sense here. How is it that your environment has so much control over you? So what, am I a puppet? Is what I used to think to myself. Things around me are controlling me and it's always, it's, you feel like you're the CEO. 
And there was a book that I read a long time ago by Louise Hay called Power of the Power is Within or something of that sort. Yes, I mean, yes. Yeah, the yeah, Power is Within or something. Yes, yes. I found that book to be, I think that was one of the first books that I read that gave me a little of insight into like thoughts and your emotions and those kind of things. So it has been a long time that I've been practicing this. It's uh, been, and it keeps evolving as I ex have more experiences. But the gist of the whole thing is stopping myself when I have a thought, analyzing that thought, is this helping me or is this going to harm me? Is this thought going to help me or harm me? Okay, someone did something. Do I really need this thought to, okay, this is what I think of thoughts. Thoughts are like visitors. <clears throat> Sometimes you have the craziest thoughts come in your mind. You don't even know where they come from. So if you associate them with visitors, you get an unexpected visitor. How do you treat that visitor? We always treat our visitors politely. Hi, how are you? Welcome. Offer them a cup of tea, whatever it is. Entertain them for a bit. And then bye-bye. Do the exact same thing with the thoughts. If I need this thought, if this is going to help me, if this is going to help me improve, evolve, get get closer to my goal, help me become a better version of who I am right now. Yes, let's entertain this. Let's go with this. If it's not, I'm not going to judge myself for having that bad thought because by doing that, I'm also putting myself down and I'm criticizing myself. Instead, I would happily say, thank you for visiting. I'm not sure where you came from, but we've had a good time with you. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> I love that you analogy. Know? That is such a good analogy. Yeah, I might steal that <laughs> off you. <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> Seriously, it explains it so well. Just if, if yeah, sure, that thought's going to come in, but you choose to close the door on it or to leave that door wide open and entertain it some more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. That's so good. That's so powerful. Tell us now about what's your story? Because this is where your life has evolved, hasn't it? You've mm -hmm. moved into being a storyteller yourself, but more importantly, allowing others to tell their own stories. Share with us the insights around that that we need to be aware of. So my book that I wrote is called What's Your Story? The reason I titled it that was because I realized that everything that we go through life is a story. All the various different experiences that we have in our life is a story in itself. Two people can be having the exact same experience, but if you ask them to narrate it back to you, you're going to get two totally different stories. Yes. Really interesting stories. And that is because of our uniqueness, our genetic makeup, how worthy we feel about just being alive. And that in itself is where the worthiness is like the fundamental. We each need to know that we are worthy. I am worthy to be alive, right? So writing this book was more of a me telling my story, but it was not actually about me so much as it is about inspiring others to grab that horse by the reins, grab that story and venture out onto it and see what they can learn from their own stories that are going on in their lives and the various different experiences that they're having. And the story is like a story within a story kind of a thing as well. It's like the story that I am telling myself about, I'll give you an example. Okay, so my husband's passed away. I have three kids. All I know how to do and all I have done for the last 20 years now, yes, I'm educated. My field is early childhood education. That's my passion. But I've worked on and off here and there in that field, followed my husband around the world because his career was thriving and his, he was thriving. So we moved, traveled around wherever his, career, his job took him. Somebody had to be the person at home when if he was going to be going out, right? That was me. Now he's not around. 
what is my story? What story am I going to tell myself? What story am I going to create out of this life that I have in front of me right now? Am I going to play the victim? Am I going to, and I can do that easily. Am I going to play the victim? Am I going to take this opportunity, take it as a learning and just take it one step at a time, do whatever it is that I need to do. And as I'm going, remind myself that I am learning. There is nothing wrong with me, not to judge myself. So self-care, I call that parenting myself. So I do a lot of that myself recently. I've been doing a lot of parenting myself. The way I parent my children, the way I'm so empathetic and understanding and observant and all of those good things that a parent does for their children, I decided to turn it around and offer some of that to myself. Beautiful. Instead of expecting it from the world, nobody knows what I need and the intensity to what I feel like I need it. So I... I'm like, okay, yes, I'm grieving. I need somebody when I need somebody, not when somebody needs to be feels they need to be there for me. So that dependency is, yes, we need people, but I will keep that space and make that look different, make that different a, a different experience. But I'm going to start parenting myself. I'm going to start caring for myself in all different aspects of exercise, food, emotionally, mentally, everything. I'm going to be kinder to myself, empathy, those kind of things. So in the same way, that's the story that I am now, I've decided that I am going to go on. That's a story that I'm creating. And I'm going to see how this unfolds, as opposed to another story that I could have went down. I'm a victim. Feel sorry for me. It's the end of the world. I, I'm young. This is not fair. This should have not happened to me justifiably, nothing wrong with that story either. Nope. What choice do you want to make? And that is where I, and, and my mission and my goal is to help people to go down that. And I love to get into discussions with anyone who would like to have that sort of open this topic up and talk about it and explore how through conversation and through sharing experiences, we actually help ourselves, but we also help others. And actually, we help others more than we help ourselves when we share our stories and speak in an authentic, open-minded way, embracing this reality that we've been exposed to. Wonderfully put. And I feel that sometimes when we actually have to speak something out loud, we actually hear what we're saying, what we're telling ourselves, because sometimes when we're not doing that, we think mm -hmm. we're thinking a certain way, mm -hmm. but our words, when we speak them, are telling something different. And yeah, and sometimes you need that two ways. Yes, 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 I agree. That is powerful, yes. Yeah, yeah. It's incredible work that you're doing, and I think it's so needed because like you say, I think just the fact that we're here on this earth makes us worthy of being here. We are all unique. We all have our own set of experiences and circumstances that dictate the path that we are walking. And it's yes. nobody else's business to determine whether that's a right path or wrong path. It's just yes. what we decide is right yes. for us and what we want to explore. I know that some people are totally happy stuck in their grief. And I am I certainly would never pass judgment on that. If that is where they want to remain and that is feel that that is where they feel they need to be, yes, by all means, stay yes. there. But it's it only is. I think your mission and my mission is to help people realize that there are choices, that mm -hmm. dreadful things can happen to really good people, and not mm -hmm. to good people, but to really good people. <laughs> 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 and that we all have a choice. And that is what my daughter taught me very early into our grief journey together. She would say, you've got five minutes to have a pity party. Go have oh. your pity party 
And then you're going to get over it, mom, because I love you. I'm wrapping you in this love and you're important to me. We're going to get back on that horse again. And I get on it. I fall off, get kicked off, get whatever. And yes. But, but I just kept taking a step forward till eventually I found that peace and that calm and that happiness mm -hmm. again. And it lives in beautiful harmony with me missing that beautiful girl in real time here and now mm -hmm. being yeah. sad. All of those things. So I think that's a good point, isn't it? It's just getting to that point where we can live in harmony with all that yes. is. Yes, just that acceptance that life and death go hand in hand. And just on a tangent there, I just, I'd like to mention this, but I had been doing a lot of thinking about why do I feel so much of grief that my mom is not around or my husband's not around or my dad's not around? And something that came to me was the level of attachment that I had to them. And then also they were alive, physical bodies were alive, right? So now that is the past. It's, you know, yes, they, <laughs> anyway, I'm not going to go into that side of the whole thing, but just that attachment of my attachment to them is what keeps me stuck in that grief also. Such a good point. So if I can just detach myself, by detaching myself doesn't mean that I've forgotten them, doesn't mean that I love them any less. It's just me detaching myself from that attachment, that the connection, that not connection, wrong word. Yeah, just that sense of I'm attached. And attachment to me is more along the lines of some form of dependency, some level of dependency it could look different in different in, for different relationships. And once I put that into perspective in my mind, I miss them for what they meant in my life to me and the value they brought to me and just that beautiful relationship that give and take between say for instance my mom and myself that relationship the dynamic of that relationship between her and myself same applies to my late husband as well and my dad dynamic of that relationship i miss him at the most important times because of the way he was he made a big deal about special occasions he would go out of his way, even if he didn't want to do what you wanted to do and it was your birthday, he would be like, and he wouldn't even show any resentment to us. He would be like, you want to do that? Sure, let's go. I'm happy. Let's go do this. Because he made it all about you. So that in itself is, I miss that. I don't have that in my life anymore. Gosh, you're making but me that... tear up. Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's a memory and it's also yeah. a learning. It's a learning because he set a standard, right? So if I look at it from that point of view, he set a standard of the level of commitment and the level of quality that you need to, or what you need to do to have this kind of a relationship, this kind of a connection. Yeah, selflessness. Yes. So because I was exposed to that, like even with my mom, because I was exposed to the level of relationship that I had with her, my standards are like, I'm trying to strive for those standards and maybe better. And I think each one of us unconsciously are actually doing that, whether we realize it or not. When our grief journey, I don't know whether this happened for you. You can see I'm mm -hmm. excited about this. <laughs> <laughs> Is that... We forget to stop for a moment and look back and see just how far we have come. Often we think we're still back in those early days, yet we've actually done a lot of work and a lot, gone through a lot of experiences that have taken us forward. And we don't always yes. realize that actually, yeah, it still hurts like crazy, but we are doing a good job. We have managed to get through all these different milestones mm -hmm. and we need to congratulate ourselves and give us ourselves a pat on the back for that. Especially Empathy. Empathy that. and gratitude. 
Oh, back to that and compassion <laughs> oh yes so let's talk about i want to finish up because i realize we've just romped through this hour that we've had together it just feels like five minutes and here it is nearly an hour on but you've got a grieve and grow challenge tell us mm -hmm. about that because i think that is a beautiful way for us to start winding down this conversation so I did put this challenge out there. It's called the Grief and Grow Challenge. There are very, various different aspects to it. The idea behind it is to choose one of those and then to show yourself doing it. For example, I am thriving in my grief and celebrate remembering my loved one, but I'm still thriving. So maybe documenting that in some form, maybe a picture or something to that effect, and then posting that onto Instagram, tagging people that you know would benefit from it as well, and maybe encourage them to also maybe take on this challenge and do that. And with that, the more people who get involved in it, uh, when we look at, I, I was just curious to see how many people would actually do this and how would they feel after doing this when you see all the other people who decide to actually interact as well? And when you look at that, it's, and I've had this experience many times, and, and what brought that up was because of the various podcasts that I've been speaking on and people that I've been speaking to about grief, I noticed every time we end, it's such, we're talking about grief and Stereotypically, it will be like you would think you're having the most morbid conversation under the sun. Yeah. But amazingly, that is not the experience at all. And we just end up having such a beautiful conversation and so empowering that it makes you feel like we don't need to be stuck here. Let's help each other. If I have something that can help you feel just an inch less stuck than you are feeling, that is good. So quickly run through the three E's for us that you use as the cornerstone <laughs> oh, yes. around this, because I think they are wonderful. Yes. So uh, the three E's basically, it, which I practice myself and I remind myself when I'm feeling down as well, it's embrace, ev empower, evolve. So embrace is basically to embrace your reality to embrace. And what if I don't want to embrace my reality? That is fine too, because you're embracing the fact that you don't want to embrace your reality, right? It's choice. But embracing whatever is going on right now, whatever it is that you're feeling, whichever way it's going, just embrace that. And then finding ways to empower yourself. And I have various different tools that I put in my book about ways that you can empower yourself. Gratitude is number one on my list. <laughs> and evolution is something that is just natural. That's going to automatically happen once you find ways to empower yourself. And when you do find ways to empower yourself, the universe also sends help your way. I really do believe that because I think that has happened to me so many times. Sometimes I didn't even realize that it was actually happening, but yeah. So embrace and power evolve. Ah, those are great. Three simple words that are mm -hmm. so powerful. And yeah, it's not asking anybody to be anything other than what they are. But actually, mm -hmm. there's a lot of uh, energy behind them. And I think it's the energy that creates shifts, whether we're mm -hmm. aware of them or not. All righty. Yeah. I, I want to wrap up our conversation with uh, three quick uh, questions I ask everyone. What is the best thing that has happened to you so far today or going to happen? Because I know you've got something planned. <laughs> <laughs> the best thing for me is I'm just really passionate about my children. And today my middle son is celebrating his 20th birthday. And yeah, so that's special to me. 20 years ago, yes, it's his birthday, but as a mother, and I think mothers, as Mother's Week, I don't know if other mothers feel this way or not, but I kind of realized that I may be celebrating my child's birthday and it is all about them, but 20 years ago, I gave birth to this human being 
it's not me. I didn't create him, but I was the process. I was the channel yes. that allowed this human being came through. And I'm just amazed at just life, the way it comes into this world and the way it unfolds and then the experiences. Yeah. So life is beautiful. It's oh. what you make. I wish him a very happy 20th and I hope you, you have a wonderful time together. What is something that you are most grateful for? <laughs> what am I most grateful for? This is going to sound absolutely, I can't even believe I'm going to say this, but here goes. I'm grateful for every single experience that I've had in my life. If I had not had those experiences and believe me, as I was going through them, I felt like this is not fair, but <clears throat> excuse me, without those experiences, I don't think I would be where I am today. And I'm just so grateful for not just the experience, but also all of the books, spiritual leaders, support, all of that good stuff that comes with it that came my way and this information age that we live in where information is so easily available, readily available. And those strangers that came into my life when I really needed support, total strangers offering me unconditional support. So I'm just utterly grateful and I just cannot express the level of gratitude I feel for that. Oh. <laughs> what a beautiful answer. Absolutely beautiful answer. I just, I felt you. I nearly was in tears myself when you were talking about that because I could feel the emotion that that you were delivering that with. And yes, oh gosh, that just went straight to my heart. What's your go-to when, and we have an expression here, when your day turns to custard, when you're having moments that are a little bit darker, how do you pivot out of those? I stop myself in my tracks and I tell myself all is well. I put my hand on my heart, I take a deep breath and I tell myself all is well. And I repeat that to myself a few times, even if I need to just lightly tapping at my heart as well, just reminding myself, all is well, everything is unfolding the way it's supposed to. I don't need to have control over anything except my present moment right now. And this present moment is precious. So what am I going, bringing that choice and the gratitude and forgiveness go hand in hand. It's like you're practicing both at some in some level, right? So I'll bring that in as well. I'm grateful that I'm here. I'm grateful that I actually have, at this given moment, have the awareness that I need to stop and do this for myself because I couldn't have. Maybe I wouldn't have had the awareness that I need to stop and uh, center myself. And that's okay too. There's nothing wrong with that, but... If I'm grateful for that as well. Oh my God, I go back to gratefulness. Oh, <laughs> I know. I was expecting that. <laughs> I knew that was going to come out somewhere along the line. <laughs> it sounds beautiful. It sounds, I, for those people who do not have a regular practice of being grateful, I just want to share with you, and, and Shmita, I know you will agree with me, just the power behind that practice it is so life transforming and until you try it yourself and you see the magic that mm -hmm. that comes from it it really is a real life yes. changer so mm -hmm. I recommend you go give it a go if you're not doing that already <laughs> yeah. oh and this moment is that we're having right now Ashmita is so precious to me to have so this opportunity to speak to you, to have you openly share your heartbreaks, but also all the the good things and the beautiful things that have come out of your heartbreak. When you were talking about not regretting anything that you've experienced in this life, I think that too has is what has gotten me to this point. 
And so I so relate to that. And to have the opportunity to speak to people like you and to share your stories, I consider an absolute privilege. And so I want to thank you so much. So we're going to have all the links of how people can contact you, how they can get hold of your book, how they can go out, check out your Instagram, all of that. We're going to have those in the episode notes. Any final parting thoughts that you would like to share? Firstly, I feel, I'm just going to say grateful. I am absolutely grateful that we've had this conversation. I really feel a connection. It was just such a beautiful conversation. And I'm just so absolutely grateful that we're able to do this. And my parting note, I would say experiences teaches. Don't let experiences define or destroy you. Take them in that light of them being a teacher and draw the positivity out of it and embrace, empower, and evolve. Thanks for listening. I hope you got some real value from this episode. If there's a topic you'd like covered, click on the beautiful side of grief at gmail.com link or go into the beautiful side of grief.com website where you can also leave a review to get notified of new episodes hit the subscribe button and if you know of somebody who could benefit from this episode please share 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 and until next time please be kind to you and take good care Just-